everyone. Now I'll go. Hello, everyone. More Nursing 204 with Karen and Deb. And by the way, it was totally fun to see everybody today. So yay you, keep up the good work and just keep um, asking questions, uh, letting us know how things are going. So uh, this video, I get to talk about oxygen therapy. And as you can see on the board behind me here, um, we have several areas that we're gonna discuss. So I'm going to use a PowerPoint and um, we will start talking about the different kinds and forms of oxygen therapy. I keep talking. Okay, so the very first category I want to talk about is the nasal cannula, and that's the one that is most familiar. Um, it has the two prongs. You always want to make certain that the prongs are curving into the nose. Then the, the tubes um, go around the ears, and you can snug up. Uh, there's a little plastic piece, so you can snug up the oxygen against the face to fit it to the patient's face. It's kind of like a cowboy hat, putting on a cowboy hat. So those are um, two important um, things to be aware of when you use the nasal cannula. Uh, you can dial in anywhere from half a liter up to 10 liters. Uh, usually if you're using four liters or more, you want to have oxygen, humidity added to it. Um, so you, there are little containers where you can put water in it. It's usually distilled water um, to help to humidify the air. Uh, more than four liters as that oxygen is blowing into the patient, it starts to dry out their mucous membrane. So the uh, humidity really helps. Uh, for our next category, we're going to talk about the simple mask. Oh, yes, Karen brought up a really good point. So one thing you also want to be aware of is as the plastic is wrapped around the patient's ears, you need to always uh, periodically check behind the patient's ears. That plastic can rub and be very irritating and patients will sometimes get ulcerations. There are like some little soft spongy uh, tube uh, on pads, pads yeah. yes, that yeah. will, you can, it has a slice down the middle and you can tuck the um, tubing inside that little pad to just help to cushion on the patient's ears. So please be aware of that. For our next um, category, we're going to talk about the simple oxygen mask. And so basically, this is a mask uh, that fits over the face. Um, you'll see on the slide there, it has a little metal piece, and you'll want to conform that to the nose. That helps to hold it in place. Um, there are some exhalation ports on the side where when people breathe out, the carbon dioxide will go out that way. Um, through those holes and then the oxygen tubing as you can see at the bottom of the mask there the oxygen tubing plugs into the mask there and you can dial in uh, the flow of oxygen that you would like so usually this mask is used for um, like the nasal cannula you can dial in even for a half a liter which is barely anything that's not usually usually start about one liter at least uh, but you can go up to 10 liters with that um, so it's just a simple mask uh, maybe you've got a restless or agitated patient um, that just keeps taking the uh, nasal cannula off so oft times masks are really helpful that way it's just a different form for delivering oxygen uh, other than the nasal cannula Next, we have the Venturi mask. And the Venturi mask, uh, you can see in this on this slide that there are different colored little hard plastic pieces. They look kind of like the capital of, like the capital. <laughs> <laughs> kind of shaped that way. <laughs> Anyhow, um, they are for different percentages of oxygen. So if you want to deliver 30%, there's a little capital <laughs> um, that has 30% on it and that's what you would insert into the mask device there and then attach the um, wall oxygen to that. Now then, you turn the wall oxygen up to 10, uh, that's the highest it will go, and then using this little device, 
uh, it will then regulate and give you the percentage that you really are wanting to have, uh, wanting for the patient to have administered. So that is your Venturi mask. Then the next is the non-rebreather mask. And this is a mask uh, that fits over the face. It also has the metal piece across the nose to help to um, conform to the nose and helps it to just, uh, it kind of creates more of a fitting for the patient so that the mask, they can get heavy and start pulling and sliding off the face. So this just kind of helps to hold it more in place. Also the elastic straps um, on the side there that you see, um, that helps to hold the mask up against the patient's face and fit the patient's face a little better. You see below the mask, there is a plastic bag and that's a reservoir. And that is a bag to help make certain that the patient is getting um, usually 100% oxygen or higher levels of oxygen. That bag, you want that reservoir bag to fill up with oxygen um, so that it is just helping the patient to get a higher amount of oxygen. The patient is still able to breathe on their own, but this is just helping to deliver uh, higher volumes of oxygen and make certain that the patient is getting a large amount. You wouldn't use this for if the patient's on 30% oxygen or anything like that. This is more when you want the patient to get 100% oxygen, the patient is in huge respiratory distress, but they're still able to breathe on their own. So um, this is when you would use this sort of device. For our next slide, we have a trach collar. And we talked about trachs. Um, it's a little collar that goes just on, around the neck. Um, it, um, in the first picture there, You'll see it kind of has an open uh, tube there. You can hook uh, nebulizing treatments onto that if the patient is to be getting some sort of nebulizing treatment. Um, and in the next picture over there, the middle picture, you'll see that sort of attachment. Um, and then the picture to the extreme right is once again just a collar, but it's, it's a collar when a patient has a trach uh, it delivers oxygen um, into the trach area. The patient is able to breathe the oxygen in through the trach area. And so once again, this is when the patients are independently breathing. They just may need a little extra oxygen support. So our next slide. Whoa, it got a little busy there. It went ahead. Uh-oh, Karen. It's okay. Let's go over there. You're fine. You're fine. Okay. <laughs> oh, why did it come up for you and not for me? <laughs> I don't know. Oh, Technical things are not my area of expertise. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, dear. So this is just uh, showing you some of um, the equipment that you're going to see for supplying of oxygen. And this is called a central oxygen supply. Um, in facilities, in hospitals, there is a main central area where oxygen or medical air, um, it, has, um, it, it has a system that's set up within the hospital where you can just access it wherever you are, in the ER, in the operating room, in the patient's room. So um, in facilities, this will be a little more of uh, what you'll be seeing. And um, in the first picture there, it has a device that helps you to regulate what, the, uh, what you want the flow to be. This would be in liters. It usually goes from zero all the way up to 10 liters. There's a little ball that floats in there so that as you turn the knob, you'll see the knobs there on the right-hand side, the black knob. Um, as you turn that black knob, um, then you'll see that little ball rise up in that clear column there and it will um, go to the level of what you have the oxygen dialed up to. Um, at the bottom of these devices, you'll see a cone. That's where the oxygen tube connects. 
On the right hand side that we were talking earlier about uh, four liters of oxygen or higher that you need to add some water for humidifying the oxygen, the air, so the patient doesn't get dried out. And this would be the sort of uh, device that you would see where you would put the distilled water in there. So that's um, that what you will see there. Ah, okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I don't know what I'd do without Karen. <laughs> That's, <laughs> That's <great>. for sure. <laughs> Uh, oxygen canisters. This is what you will see times if the patient is getting, um, being mobilized. Uh, maybe they're going down to lunch or dinner. Uh, maybe they have to go to a doctor's appointment or something. So these are portable canisters. They're needing to continue to have uh, oxygen while they're wherever they're going. Um, they're on oxygen continuously. So this would be a portable canister. Oftentimes, if the patient is in a wheelchair, um, there's already a holder where the oxygen canister will go. If the patient uses a walker, oftentimes they'll have, um, they've created little harnesses that the patient can put their oxygen can canister in there so that they can mobilize. So um, there is a fantastic video that we will want you to watch. It's with Frank. <laughs> and Frank will tell you a whole lot about these canisters. So you want to make sure they're full when you take them. Yes, please make sure they're full when you take them. Yes, absolutely. And Frank will get into um, how to check that and also that you are aware. So excellent. Then uh, we want to talk about the oxygen concentrator. So these devices are really pretty cool. Um, you will see these a fair amount in facilities. What these devices do is they take ambient air, just regular air, um, and the concentrator will pull that air in and then it turns it into oxygen. I don't know how it does it, it's magic. More, it's more concentrated? Yes, yeah, it can, it can create, I don't know if it's 100% or not, but oh, oh. yeah, it, it creates oxygen from regular air, it pulls, oxygen out of the regular air and then it is delivered to the patient uh, through this device. So you'll see on the left hand side there's a little dial and there's kind of a clear column. That is where you dial in the amount of oxygen that you want to have. In the center there you'll see kind of a scooped out area there, a rounded area there. That is where um, you will attach your O2 tubing and then uh, on the right side um, there are some alarms there, but also the on off button. Uh, usually there are filters on these that need to be washed weekly just because it is pulling in air from the environment and um, turning it into oxygen to then be delivered to the patient. So uh, the next uh, piece to discuss is a CPAP machine. Um, that's okay, don't worry about it. So a CPAP device is a device uh, that a lot of people have in their homes. It's for people who have sleep apnea. And what that does is, as you know, when people have sleep apnea, they snore. And um, what happens is the tongue falls back in the throat and it occludes the airway. So when they, when they snore, it's because it's occluded and then they'll kind of take this gas um, and when they do that, of course, the tongue um, moves forward and it opens the airway. So what the CPAP device is, is it, it's a little machine that um, provides continuous pressure to help to keep the airway open so the patient doesn't have sleep apnea. As we have learned uh, in recent years, sleep apnea uh, can really create some cardiac issues and other issues um, as we age and get older. So uh, that's that's the CPAP device. It's a home device usually. Then there is a BiPAP device and that's the next step up. Um, it provides um, 
two kinds of pressure. It provides inhalation pressure and exhalation pressure. So uh, patients, elderly patients that are really having a tough time with breathing, um, it's, it's a device that you find in the hospital and it helps with both inhalation and exhalation. It's kind of the next, the next step is the, putting the patient on a ventilator. So oftentimes if it's an elderly patient that doesn't want big heroic measures um, completed, then this would be the machine that they would use to help the patient breathe. Uh, then the ventilator. The ventilator is uh, in, used in acute care settings. It is for patients that are not able to support their respiratory system and the machine totally um, takes care of all that for them. Uh, it's a matter of putting the endotracheal tube down into the lungs and then um, the doctor will say whatever settings they want. It'll set the rate for how many respirations they get a minute, uh, how much pressure should stay in their lungs. Sometimes if patients' lungs have collapsed, uh, it's called PEEP pressure. It's a pressure that helps to keep the lungs expanded so the lungs won't collapse down. Um, they can set, you know, how frequently you breathe, they breathe in or out. I mean, it's, it is, a very controlled machine. There are a lot of um, a lot of parameters, a lot of um, categories to address um, to help make certain that you're supporting the patient, and then and the ventilator is doing all the breathing for the patient. So using a lot of those now. Yeah, they are using a lot of those right now, exactly. So Karen's going to talk a little bit about uh, some respiratory issues. <laughs> you look darling. <laughs> okay, so I don't remember if you guys got this in farm or not. I think you did, and I'm sure that you got it in bio. But we're going to talk just a little bit. I know we talked about the vascular system, but let's talk just a little bit about the pulmonary system, uh, how you breathe. If you remember, where does all exchange taste, take place? All exchange, nutrients, gases, waste, all of that. Where does that all take place? It takes place at the capillary level. It doesn't take place in the arteries or the veins or the arterioles or the venules. It takes place in the capillaries. So I'm gonna draw a little picture of two square boxes and those are your lungs for today. Those are lungs. And remember that you have your bronchi that come down, a bronchus that splits into different trees down into your lungs. And at the end of the bronchi, I'm only going to give you one lung today. Okay. You have one lung. You're breathing heavy. <laughs> but you're born with about 300 million to 700 million, I can't give you the reference right now, of the alveoli. Remember the little alveoli, the little balloons like sacs at the end at the terminal bronchus, right? So you're born with about three to 700 million of those. When people have issues, let's say asthma, um, Asthma, a lot of times we'll use inhalers, uh, a buterol, uh, steroids. And unfortunately, steroids destroy tissues. And so those little alveoli, after a while, those little alveoli can break. And if they break, they cannot exchange anything because they can't blow up. Also with smoking, when the alveoli with smokers, it gets covered on the outside. This is kind of backwards, but here we go. It gets covered on the outside with tar. And the tar makes it so that it can't exchange. It can't do its job. The capillaries can't work. And so again, what happens is it breaks. If it breaks, it can't hold oxygen. Now, when you have individuals with COPD, they've had a lot of alveoli that no longer work, they don't function. And so 
when they breathe in, they get oxygen. But what happens when we breathe out? We get rid of CO2. We feed the trees, right? We get rid of CO2. But because they don't have enough alveoli, I always tell people, think about if you're smoking, every time you take a puff, let's say you pop one alveoli. So throughout your life, if you're a 20 year smoker, et cetera, you're destroying these alveoli. And so you have the CO2 levels that build up in your blood. And when you breathe in, you breathe in oxygen. When you breathe out, you breathe out CO2, except you don't have enough to take out the CO2 levels. And so these people, COPD, they're called CO2 retainers. They retain CO2. And if you remember, when you're breathing, what causes you to breathe? It's not lack of oxygen. It's the increase of CO2 in your blood. It creates an acidic environment in your blood. And if you remember, blood has to stay between 7.35 and 7.45. You get outside those parameters, crazy things start happening. So if the blood says, um, we're getting acidic here, I'm down to 7.28, this is not cool. I don't like this. Then it tells you you're starving for oxygen. You're starving for oxygen, you need to breathe. Just breathe! Because my acidity is too high because I'm retaining all that CO2. CO2 is acidic. So CO2 retainers have lots of CO2 they can't get rid of. So if you feed them higher amounts of oxygen, they have higher amounts of CO2, then they think they need to breathe because they're starving for oxygen because there's higher amounts of CO2. And so when you have a COPD patient, you never give them more than four liters. When you send them out on the ambulance, the first thing they're gonna do is put on a mask and turn it all the way up. This is an issue, but you can't do anything about that. That's something. And there, uh, percent of oxygen, their, their oxygen saturation is usually supposed to be between 89% and 92%. It's not supposed to be any higher than 92%. And if you get it higher than 92, they're going to start starving for oxygen and they can go into respiratory failure. So it's not that you're getting it higher, you're just giving them more oxygen. So always make sure you look on a chart to find out if they have COPD or any respiratory issues like that. Does that make sense? I hope so. Okay, I'm gonna turn you back to Deb. <laughs> All right, okay. So we just wanna talk a little bit about uh, respiratory medications, some of the devices that, uh, the green dot. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm just going to give you one eye. <laughs> Not the stink eye. <laughs> Save that one for me. <laughs> I don't think so. So just want to talk about some respiratory medications that you're probably going to see uh, when you're in the facility and just show you kind of how they work. So initially, we're going to start with uh, scheduled medications. And uh, at their discus, this is probably one that you're going to see a fair amount of. Uh, it's kind of a funky little contraption, <laughs> but the way this works is you open it up, then you'll see there's a little device, right, a little button right here. So you pull this down, and what this does, it, it provides a dose. It's metered inside here. It provides a dose. The patient sucks, inhales, um, they put their mouth over this open hole right here and they inhale and breathe in and they get the medicine this way. They're supposed to take it in, hold it for a little bit, slowly let it out, take in another breath again to make certain that they got all the medication. So this is one device that you will probably see. Also too, what's really cool, I don't know if you can see it right there, 
there is a little counter there. So uh, when you, if you are doing medications and all to make certain that the patient has enough medication that they aren't getting down, you definitely wanna pay attention to that counter so you know. And um, there are devices like this <clears throat> on most respiratory medications so that you can keep track so you know. Uh, this is a device. It's used for Spirella. It's yet another medication. Uh, it's a powder form. It comes with little capsules. So what you do with this device, you open this package. And you'll see, hmm, green dot. <laughs> oh, this is so crazy. Uh, um, you'll see there's a little, little capsule right there. So you push this button right here and that opens that up. Then you'll see there's this little mouthpiece right here. You lift that up. Then you will see there's a hole right here. So you want to put that capsule right in that hole. I don't know if you can see it in there. Then what you do is you close this. Oh, I should point out, right here is a little screen. Um, it looks kind of like a window screen, as a matter of fact, so that when you put this over, then you wanna push this button again here, push it in. It punctures that capsule in there, and then the patient breathes on this mouthpiece so they get the medication, the dose of the medication. So this is a Spireva um, device. I, this is usually the only way I've ever seen Spireva come, as a matter of fact. So this is uh, one of the devices you'll see. Then I have two canisters here. So honestly, I haven't used these all that much. They're kind of, kind of, um, they're new for me. With this one, it's it. You turn it, and it'll click, and then the patient breathes on the end here. Um, there is a device, a reading device here on the side that you can see, so that you can keep track of how many doses are left within this canister but this is one that you will see. Oh, uh, this is called, oh, this is Spireva Resperimat. Huh, I thought that the only way, I've only seen this. <laughs> Me too. So I'm not, I, Karen hasn't seen this either. So I'm not certain that you'll see this very much in the facility. It's not really something that I am familiar with, um, but just to, show you different devices. This is called uh, Asmanix. So the way this works, that piece comes off, then you twist the base here, and that sets up for the dose, and then you breathe in through that hole, and the dose will be delivered. There is also a counter on the side, oh, green dot, Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> you can see there are numbers right there in that little window and that's a counter device as well. So this is another form. Um, this is another style for administering uh, respiratory medication. The one that probably everybody is most familiar with are these little inhalers. And uh, these are usually your albuterol inhalers uh, for patients that have asthma and all. Um, one way you can tell how full this is, some devices will have a counter on here. This one does, you can see there's a little counter there. But if you don't have a counter, uh, one thing you can do is you can fill up the sink with water and drop the canister in there. And depending on how much air is in the canister, meaning there's that much of the medication gone, uh, the more heavy the canister is and it sinks into the water, the more medication is in there. The more the canister floats up towards the top of the water, that means there's more air in there and there's less medication in there. So that's one way of keeping track. 
However, we've gotten smart recently and we've done these counters. So I think most um, of the respiratory medications um, have the counter devices. And, and it sh as it should be, because um, you really don't want your asthmatics to go, uh, to run out of their medications. So the way this works, this little device is called a spacer. And it is used to help uh, so the patient gets the medication, inhales all the medication. You'll see there's an opening on the end and the canister fits right in there. Shake this first, make certain that you've mixed up the medicine thoroughly. Then you put that in here and you tell the patient um, on the count of three, you're gonna administer the medicine. And so tell them to breathe out and then one, two, three. And then what you do is you push, I'm not going to dispense this because there is real medicine in here, but you push the canister down and that will squirt the medicine into the um, spacer here. The patient is has the mouthpiece in their mouth and they're slowly breathing in and out to make certain that they get the medication. And the medication will stay in this um, spacer so that they can get the full dose. So uh, a lot of these medications, it will tell you that you need to rinse out your mouth after you've had them because uh, people who use a lot of these steroid medications and all can get thrush, thrush, yeah. <laughs> thrush <laughs> in their mouth. So it really is important for people to rinse out their mouth and, and spit uh, all that out to make certain. <laughs> And yes, rinse out their spacer as well. Absolutely. The last piece I want to talk about is nebulizers. Um, nebulizers are usually used, um, well, they can be used in the hospital setting, the facility setting, in the home setting. Um, it all depends on uh, what the patient is needing uh, for their medication and the administration of it. So this is a handheld uh, nebulizer, and what usually it comes, the patient will have a little machine like this, and the oxygen tubing will fit right here. There's a little nipple right there that the oxygen tubing will attach to. Then what you will do is, we always call this an acorn, but this top piece will unscrew. You will have little plastic ampules. There's liquid in here. So you twist off the top, that breaks that open. You squirt it down inside here. There's a little open area there um, that you squirt this medicine down in here. Then you turn on the machine, it's always noisy. <laughs> And it'll, what it will do is it will provide air to come through here. And what it does is it turns the medicine into a um, aerosol so that the patient, when they uh, are, they'll usually just sit and breathe in and out slowly. Um, and that aerosolized medicine will go down into the lungs. Um, usually... One, one thing that we always said to patients was when it's, you don't see smoke coming out of the end of this tube anymore, that means that probably the medication has all been administered. But um, you'll, what you'll see with patients is it looks like a little, like there's smoke coming out of the end of the tube and it will um, just dissipate into the air. But uh, usually once all the medication is out of here, it'll start hissing and then you won't really see the smoke coming out of the end. So there's also, you can do a, a nebulizer treatment that the patient isn't able to hold uh, the acorn, the canister. You can put it, uh, attach it to a mask as well. Or if they won't hold it. Or if they won't hold it. Yes, exactly. You get those people too. Exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, you're going to meet all kinds. <laughs> so you want to sit with them, not wait for them. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So anything else? I got two cents. Oh, Karen has two cents. I love it. Go for it. Yeah. So this is a rescue inhaler. This is what this is. If it's an albuterol, it's called sometimes called a rescue inhaler. 
these are not. None of these will be used in an emergent situation. This one will. And do you just administer two puffs right away? You don't. You read the directions. And what the directions say is five minutes between them. Does it mean after you've administered two doses and they're still in trouble and no EMTs are on their way that you can't administer another dose? It does not. You have to administer every five minutes unless you've got someone on the way. What's going to happen to heart rate and pulse? Because with steroids, what's going to happen? Kind of increased heart rate, increase, um, which means increased pulse. But they're also going to have increased what? Blood pressure. Also increased what? Blood sugar. So when you have patients that are diabetic using these, you're going to have to watch other measures to make sure that they're still safe. So that's really important. Other thing uh, I forgot to mention is O2 is a medication. Did you mention it? I forgot. As a medication, no, I did not. Yeah, so O2 is Thank a medication, you. and you yes. have, and I, I forget this too. Can a CNA turn on or turn off a concentrator? Of course they can. Can they adjust it? No, they cannot. So if they take a patient off to a get ready for appointment, they turn off the concentrator, put on their O2, and then take them to out for their transportation. But can a CNA say, well, he's not getting enough and adjust that medication? No, they cannot. That is out of their scope of practice. Can they turn the concentrator back on when they put them back in bed? I hope they do. <laughs> that would be important because if they're gonna call the nurse every time they transport a patient back and forth to a room, but again, they need to know what they need to be on and not have to adjust it, right? If they've been trained, if they have not been trained, no. But if they have been trained, they can turn it on, turn it off, not adjust. Can you adjust it? Can you come in and go, oh, they're not breathing very well. They're on two liters. I'm going to crank it up to four. You cannot. You are not a physician, and you did not write a prescription. Can you do an emergent increase while you call the doctor so that you're taking care of your patient? You can, but you can't go above four liters unless, well, you've got respiratory failure, which you're going to turn it up. You're going to do the right thing. But you as a nurse can give only two liters without a prescription from a physician saying you have to increase that unless, you, again, you're in an emergent situation and you have been trained. So anything out of your scope of practice, that's why it's so nebulous. If you've if it's not in black and white and you've been trained by medical personnel, that kind of thing, um, you, you need to feel uh, free to be able to take care of your patients. Okay? Yeah. All right. That was my two cents. I'm done. Good two cents. Are you Yay! done too? I'm done too. Okay. We'll talk to you on the next video. Absolutely. I know, I know you're so excited. <laughs> right. Bye for now. Bye. Go wash your hands.